We are back in session. Thank you. Nancy and Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you. So good afternoon. Um, so I am Nancy Bush. I'm the Disaster Management Department Director, and I have Sarah Ekman with me here today. Um, she's our Administrative Services Manager. Um, so we have two programs in our department. We have the Disaster Management Program, and we have our Medical Examiners Program for the county. And both of those programs are required um, are required um, by state statute and we like to think that we are a small department but we have a very big mission um, so the mission of the uh, disaster management department most of you have seen that before um, we're looking at fostering more resilient communities uh, prepare response recovery um, and then we also have our medical examiners um, so um, then they're providing equitably, equitable access and services and, um, and to, their, uh, to their constituents as well. So our services, um, we are trying to foster more resilient communities. The planning and projects in our community zones, which we've developed a couple years ago. Um, we have been working on those um, and trying to bring those communities together so they become more resilient. Um, we have also taken uh, resident and business notifications uh, of emergency events and life safety instructions seriously. So we do have a new software that we have in place um, so we can notify the residents more quickly and more efficiently. And um, we're res responsible for resiliency and mitigation projects in the county related to disaster management. Some of the projects are related to recovery, which take a great deal of our time. Um, for example, we still have uh, work, we're still working on recovery efforts from the 2015 flood, which was in the Lake Road area of the county. And I do have a staff member that has spent easily an average of 35 to 45% of his time on those particular buyouts and recoveries in that area. We work with our stakeholders and have discussions at the state and local level regarding, regarding channel migration zones, which are CMZs. Um, which is also a recovery effort, and that had continues from 2011. So we've been working on that for several years. And the medical examiner's office um, has program staff, and they provide services to public law enforcement and the district attorney's office by providing timely death investigations, as well as compensate services to surviving families and friends. Um, and they also continue to work closely with the state medical examiner's office to meet and set goals. So when we look at the overall arching uh, goals of the county, um, I think we do touch both safe, all three of safe, he healthy, and secure communities. Um, our de department budget, departmental budget request. Our uh, departmental request this year is fairly stable, as you can see by the yellow line. Uh, disaster management from the general fund is requesting just a little over $1.2 million, um, actually almost $1.3 million. And the medical examiner's general fund request is a little over $1 million. The medical examiner's program is 100% general fund, and again, it's required. Um, and the disaster management program's operations are primarily general fund with a small amount of grant funding, which is about $150,000 a year that goes toward our operations. Um, we also have been uh, relying heavily on our beginning balance, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. But um, in order to balance our budget, we have been um, relying on our, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, balance, the beginning balance for several years now. So also, if you'll notice from the graph, we do plan for a large amount of dollars from other federal resources that are passed through dollars. Uh, which means they go to our local entities in our county, not um, our program operations. And I know that that has been a discussion among the budget committee, and you've asked some questions about that to us, um, which we've gotten through the finance staff. And so Sarah's going to just take a couple of minutes to go over those dollars in more detail and give you a little bit more explanation of what we're looking at there. Great. Thank you. I believe that you have this packet um, and would ask that you turn to page 7 in it. I wanted to walk you through some of the um, more fluctuating percentages uh, where it says percentage change from prior year, prior year budget, just to give you a few answers to questions that might come up as you look at these numbers and 
see those large uh, percentage jumps, whether they're up or down. Um, starting towards the top, there's a negative 50% uh, jump in state grants and revenues. Uh, we have had a grant from the state fire marshal's office for the last couple of years, and so in doing that, you can see the initial amended budget from last year was 16,000. It's down to eight. Um, given the small amount of that grant, that leap took it down at that 50% mark. Um, but as you go down into the middle section, there's some more notable numbers. Um, there's a 95% increase on materials and services. Uh, there are over $900,000 in this line item that are passed through dollars for some of our grant funding streams. So the way that this report um, pulls all of the numbers together, it has included that there. So it makes it look like we've had a very large increase when in fact most of that money is going through and is passing on to other agencies. In that, we have um, a property elevation, uh, part of a property acquisition project, as well as some miscellaneous grants that fund specific projects for things like fuel planning um, and then um, other regional projects that are passed through dollars. We also um, had a big reduction. You can see the 78% a downward trend in capital outlay. Um, in last year's budget, we anticipated two property buyouts. So this year, we're only budgeting for half of a piece of equipment that is for the medical examiner's office um, that is grant funded. So that also took a significant reduction. And then under special payments, we budgeted $182,000 this year. That is for a single property or, um, property or piece of equipment that's being purchased uh, for the city of Oregon City, and again, it's a pass-through. Mm -hmm. So most of our numbers where there's big leaps and bounds, it's the fluctuation of the grant funding that's coming through our budget. So to reiterate a couple of things there, to, we know that these, a lot of what we do up front, in, because we don't know what we're going to be getting over the next year, we're guessing to some degree. We kind of know some things, some things we don't. Some things are luck of the draw and depends on what happens to certain funding formula or, yeah, funding formulas that are in the state through, for the federal money. Um, so we're going to try to take a really close look at this and try to right size it as we move forward so you'll see maybe less of a cushion there. Um, there's been times, too, that all of a sudden UASI dollars, which is Urban Area Security Initiative dollars, will go late in the fiscal year to someone in our county, and we need to make sure we cover that so we have enough authority. So we do try to have a cushion there as well. All right. Uh, budget reductions. Um, we did not take the two to five percent general funded uh, general fund target um, that other county departments did take. Uh, we are uh, core programs according to state statute, and we continue to struggle with our declining beginning balance, uh, which I know you've had those discussions before in last year as well. Um, so we do take whatever money we have. We maintenance our, we use it for maintenance. We have not had any increase in programs or staff um, since like 2009. Uh, we lost a staff member in 2009 and never regained, regained that person back. So we do pr pretty much stay on maintenance and what we're doing there. We also, if we do have a disaster to occur, we do not have any other reserves right now. If that we have a medium to a large size disaster not even counting catastrophic, that's a whole new ball game. But we don't have extra money to put into that if we do have a disaster. So, you know, we would have to go to the county administrator, to the BCC as well if we needed money to, to cover those types of things as well. I do mention here that we did um, say that we would volunteer to give faci our fac facilities management savings back to the general fund. Um, it's only $1,400, I do understand that, but we did do that in the county spirit, all capital letter letters, and recognizing that we do have some um, issues and we have a lot of uh, budget issues coming up in front of us in the next year or so. Um, again, we do have two lines of business. We have the disaster management and the medical examiner. Um, we have goals that we're reporting on today. Um, the first goal there is um, that 90% of our required disaster management plans are up to date and approved. Uh, we do think we're going to hit our 100% target this year. 
Um, we did not quite make that last year because we did have some funding issues on a couple of the plans that we were working on, but those have now been completed. 75% um, of the Clackamas County departments had up to date approved continuity of operations plans. We call them those COOP plans. Uh, right now, we're looking at 35%, and we were hoping to have at least 75%. So obviously, we're falling short there. Uh, we are a program that we actually depend on others to do some work in order to help meet our goals. Uh, but we do have a strategy to try to get those numbers up that we're going to be working on between now and October because we want to get it all done before the shakeout. And hopefully, we'll get those numbers up to 75% at that time. Um, our CSUN's calls uh, connected to residents. <clears throat> Excuse me, you'll see in the past we've looked at some like 46%. We do have a new software now that is more efficient and effective um, and actually has also more things that we can do with it, including wireless um, connection through the cell tower so we can let everyone know in an area if something's going on. Um, so we do expect those numbers to go up as well. For the medical examiner's office, um, we have percent of seen on scene investigations uh, with associated interviews and investigations with the uh, quality assurance reviews that are conducted. Uh, the quality assurance reviews is a national standard that we need to live by, which we do. We actually hit um, our goals very, very easily there. Uh, we look at 4% of our calls, and actually we have a supervisor that goes out on 4% of the calls to make sure we're meeting those standards. And we're meeting those standards at least 95%. We like to see it as close to 100 as we can get, but we know it, people are not perfect. Um, the total number of medical examiner cases, um, we're looking at 1,200 this year, uh, which is about even with last year, which surprised us just a little bit. Um, because as your population grows, obviously your deaths in your county grow as well. Uh, but the suspicious deaths has remained pretty level over this past year. Um, just a couple other things. We do have a lot going on here um, in the county um, with our program. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we are hoping to be able to measure. We are taking a look at our MFR and trying to put a few more measures in there that will help us understand a little bit more of how we're reaching people. We do continue to work to reach on people with projects and the populations that are most impacted by disasters. And this year we actually had a PSU fellow come and working and reaching out to Spanish and Russian speaking communities. And we're currently working with Mercy Corps to get a group of individuals in the region that will help us and actually go out and help us train and give information to those communities before, during, and after disasters. Because we have a hard time, we may have something that they can use or resources after disaster, but we have not been able to reach some of those communities. So we continue to work on that as well. We also have a very active amateur radio program. Um, they are more and more active every year. We get more and more people that are actually coming to Clackamas County and saying that they want to be a, on the amateur radio group. Um, and we support them quite a bit. In any large disaster, you'll hear, it's like, well, the only communication we had was amateur radio. Um, so we want to make sure we have a very robust amateur radio group as well. Um, we can continue to work uh, toward a strong emergency operations staff through training and exercises that will have staff that can provide a solid response in real events. Um, right now, we have around 110 people that are trained to be in our emergency operations center. They are people that are Clackamas County employees. We would not like to double that number. Um, some of the exercises we've had recently, we realized that we need a much deeper bench for 24 seven operations for a large event than what we have right now. So we're gonna continue to work on that, probably work on some strategies on how do we make that happen here in our county. And I will say we do very well when you talk to other counties and I tell them we have about 110 people, they're like, wow, I wish we had that. So we have very active people, very active in working with us. We just need just a few more. Uh, we continue planning um, for important areas such as fuel and wildland fire evacuation planning. 
Um, debris management planning continues um, for the, at least the commissioners in the room. You know we've been working on that for a couple of years. That is a very, very tough one to do the planning for. Uh, we are working with DTD and procurement, and we're hoping to be able to get that plan to FEMA for them to review in the next two to three months. Zone planning is going to become a high prior priority in the next fiscal year. Uh, so you can see how we're helping our communities and how we can help them to be as resilient as possible. The zone planning includes everyone from businesses to our fire districts, schools, you know, all of those community members that will come together during disaster to help each other out and to be more resilient. <clears throat> uh, we also continue to be regional leaders um, in the Regional Disaster Preparedness Organization, which is the RDPO. Um, in fact, Chair Bernard is the vice chair for the RDPO Policy Committee. Uh, we have our staff that um, are either in leadership or participatory, participatory roles in the steering committee recovery framework planning, mass fatality response, regional resource planning, and many other areas that we can bring here and um, increase our resiliency and our response to disasters. We do have some emerging issues. Uh, first is the medical examiner's office to talk about that. I put this on here last year as well. And last year I put within the next five years. I've now put to in the next five, four to five years. Um, but as the population continues to grow, again, the deaths that we have to, to uh, investigate will grow as well. Um, we have a 24-7 operation, a medical examiner's office. So there comes a point where you can't do it with the three people that are covering 24 seven right now. And we also have a working supervisor there too that covers part of that. Um, but there's gonna come a point we're gonna need another staff person there. And I'm looking out at four to five years, maybe, depending on how fast the population continues to grow. With climate change, um, comes more severe natural disasters, particularly in our area, we're looking at wildland fires. We're seeing more and more flooding and winter storms as well. Um, not only does that increase our cost in disaster management, it increases the cost for the entire county. Um, some of the examples I can use there, the West had an outfall in uh, 2011 on the Sandy River that had to be replaced at the tune of $2 million. Um, other infrastructure like highways and roads, um, that infrastructure is also destroyed, which also we have to um, you know, replace or uh, re either replace do something else with it, make it more resilient, those types of things. So that is a, a something for the entire county that becomes more and more expensive. Federal funding continues to decline for our operational disaster management mitigation and recovery programs. Uh, fewer dollars are available through uh, mitigation. Um, the operational program that we do have, which we get about $150,000 for, is the um, em emergency management performance grant. I expect this year, and this is me expecting this, that the state will probably take more of that money this year, which means we'll get even less. So that continues to shrink. Uh, looking at risk-based planning, which is something we're, we're just now starting to really look at more and more uh, for the whole community approach and the highlights and what that really looks, at, looks like. Um, so we want to look at a whole community model when considering what disaster, disaster management should look like in the future. Um, in 2017, there were 59 federally declared disasters, one of the most expensive years on record for the United States. And um, the, the, those natural disasters cost insured losses of over $78 billion, with a B, billion dollars. That does not count anything uninsured and in infrastructure and those types of things that we self-insure as, as governments. So obviously it's very challenging when we start looking at those large disasters and what do they look like. So it's very challenging for all of us to take a look at that. Um, we need to look at that as communities, as different agencies, organizations, and pulling our resources together in order to plan for those, those events as well as getting through those events as well as paying for those events. And of course, as we look forward, um, it's very, it's difficult to try to pull all of that together because all of us have obviously limited resources, uh, but that's something that we're trying to pull together too through the zone planning and having those resources pulled together so that we will have a better response to disasters as we move forward. 
And that is all I have today. Not sure where I am so on much. time. We have a couple of questions, so we'll start with Commissioner Humberston. Just a uh, quick, um, <clears throat> in the continuity of operations plans and the other plans that are, are mandated, um, there are cost recovery uh, from the uh, federal government for a, for a major disaster. Yeah, but there's it, some record keeping requirements that go with that. Would you, just for the benefit <laughs> of others, would you kind of share what it takes in order to maintain records during an emergency so that you can get the reimbursement on those costs? Yes, they're very meticulous about that. Um, so they, it has to be a federally declared disaster before we can get any kind of reimbursement. Most of the reimbursement that we will receive is 75 and then 25 on the local community. Um, debris management is a little different, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But so in order, though, to get that kind of reimbursement, you have to write literally everything down. So, and part of our 25% can also be volunteers, but you actually have to have your volunteers sign in. Time sheet. Yes. And when did they sign out in order to be able to gain that? Um, if we use someone else's equipment, we use a tractor. So FEMA <coughs> has a, a chart. It's like if it's this kind of a tractor and it fits in this you know, category, you pay so much per hour for that tractor. So if we get a tractor from Multnomah County and they charge us $80, but the feds say, well, we're only paying $40 an hour for that, <coughs> then we're on the hook for the rest of it. But it's very meticulous record taking and keeping. Uh, procurement, finance, there is a really, really heavy load on them as well uh, because all of our overtime as a county also has to be kept. We work with our accounting system to say, okay, what well, we get a number, we assign a number, so if you're working in the EOC, you have to write down, it's like I'm in the EOC, and we only get reimbursed for overtime, and so there's that large lift as well. Um, it takes a lot of money to get money, um, but those, those are the types of things we're looking at, and they really look at everything, and it is possible they look at everything, they give you the money, they audit you, and then they come back and say, mm, no, why, yeah, we want a million dollars back. Which has happened. Well, they'll definitely audit you after the fact. And right? they definitely, and I've it will be it. like at a time when you're like, oh, we even forgot we had that oh, disaster. Oh, yeah, it, it's later. but <laughs> It yeah. is, but they do. Yeah. Um, and, and if you don't record things at the time, you're in trouble. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. And so we, we're working very hard to make sure that that happens. Sarah is in charge of our EOC, um, and we're trying to make sure that all of that documentation is there. It's really, really difficult, though, whenever you're working with cities and other agencies making sure they're doing it too, because we're all in this together when that happens. I just asked the question because I wanted the public who may actually choose to watch these deliberations to understand how, how um, intricate it can be mm -hmm. to it get is. that money back. And if you don't do it that way, yeah. all of that um, uh, reserves and contingency funds that you've set aside that you tap into for that emergency can all disappear and never be replaced if you don't do it by the book. Right, and so, it's very labor intensive. And you have to have people trained ahead of time to yeah. know how do, to do it. Because so, you yeah. can't walk in and start right. doing that, which is why our training is so critical in our EO. So, and have enough people that they're not so glassy-eyed they miss things. You know, we mm -hmm. can't have people running 24-hour shifts. Right, I mean, they're tired, they're working hard. Yeah. Extra yeah. shifts, so. yeah. Mr. Feely, you're next, sir. Thank you. Um, since you chose the cover to be the area off Lake Road, could you talk? Very close to my house, not too close. Oh, okay. Um, could you talk a little bit about what's going on in that area to mitigate further flood damage? Cause sure. Because floods every time it rains. So um, right now, mm -hmm. I will say, I'm going to get back to the picture so it can be referred to here. Um, yeah, so this is a lake road area. So if those of you who know the area, that is actually kind of split between unincorporated Clackamas mm -hmm. and the city of Milwaukee. So we work very closely with the city of Milwaukee on some mitigation issues down there. Um, we, we have tried in the past to get some mapping done there down there because um, the rains are very different now. We get flash flooding down there, and it is kind of in a bowl. It is. Yeah. So we're, we have been exploring trying to find some, somewhere where we can get a grant or something to do some mapping in that area. Uh, one of the things that we've done most recently is I believe the city of Milwaukee did a buyout for at least two homes, maybe three. 
Um, and we are in the process right now of trying to um, buy out a home as well. And it's, it's just taken a while because yeah, of many, so. many different moving parts. As you know, FEMA has many, many different moving parts. Mm -hmm. So we are buying out as much as we can down there and turning it back into green space. Um, so, but we also have had homeowners come to us and say, we have repetitive lost property. And so for FEMA, that means that it, there doesn't have to be a flood for us to try to buy them out, oh, okay. but it's competitive. So we have to turn it in and say, we would like to buy out this home or these three homes because we have willing buyers there. And we do have one or two that are looking and saying and asking questions. Mm. So we encourage that as well. And we're going to FEMA on that and saying, you know, we, we want to apply for this funding in order to do some buyouts before another event like this happens. So is there any thought to warning people that move in that area? I mean, I know there are a bunch of apartments there. I just wonder, is so there full disclosure before There has been some in? state um, legislation on that mm -hmm. and where you have to do full disclosure. And it's like, and they're looking at, well, the disclosure is, have you ever had to buy flood insurance? You're supposed to disclose yeah. if you've had a flood. Right. But the legislation is saying, you need to disclose if you've ever, if you were required to buy flood insurance or if you ever have bought flood insurance for and your what home. about apartments? The apartments are a little trickier yeah. on that. Um, and as far as I know, there is nothing there that requires them to disclose anyone who might be moving in. Okay. Yeah, every now and then I see question. people moving in and oh boy. It's a very, yeah, the and there's one yeah. building down there in particular that yeah. gets hit pretty hard. I think that's right. But as far about. as I know, there is no law around okay, that. Thank you. My other question is on the use your ending fund balance, and you correctly stated that that's not an ongoing way to support your budget. But how much longer do you think that'll last, and what order of magnitude of so, reductions? So yeah, you have so to make? Um, we did the the budget committee did agree to give us two hundred fifty thousand dollars for a couple of years. So we're we've got that cushion right. built in again. We are dipping into that between two hundred and two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Okay. So it won't last that long. Not long. Yeah. Not long. And if we lose more funding because that 150000 goes away, it's going to be even more. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Savas, then Ms. Lee, then Commissioner Fisher. Well, Nancy, um, question. As the state endeavors into this emergency management in the, in the event of a Cascadia or mm -hmm. fire departments do this, water utilities all do it to some degree. We're all putting a lot of effort and resources into emergency management. I'm just wondering, are you seeing, obviously you're not seeing an uptick in funding coming our way, but is there a greater amount of revenues being spent um, yeah. on a state level or, or how are we faring as a county compared to all those other agencies I listed? <clears throat> So we really, even there's grants that are here and there, okay? So we, we compete for some of those grants too. So some of them we get, some of them we don't. Um, the State Homeland Security Grant, those dollars are declining, but we do compete for those. And this year, or this next year, I mean, we've had everything from like $30,000 to $200,000 per, you know, it just depends on when they go through the process, what comes to the top. Um, I know some of the water districts are really um, struggling to make sure they have, a, you know, sufficient plans in place and trying to work on that. Their infrastructure, it's pretty much on their own. I don't know anyone that's gotten a grant to update their infrastructure because none of those grants support that. Um, but we do have a couple of our water districts that at least have gotten grants to do planning and maybe even do an assessment, a gap analysis assessment. So there really is not a lot of money. It's interesting because we all know we need to do it, but there's not a lot of money pouring in to do it. Um, the state does have a couple of federal employees now that are sitting at the state to help with some planning efforts at the state level. So they have gotten that. And primarily, I think a lot of that's due to Cascadia. We're not seeing that impact the locals yet, but they've only been there a few months. So how, how do we rank as far as counties? Um, in the metro region or in the northern part, northwestern part of the state, how, how do we rank as far as our investment per capita? Are we doing more than most? Um, no. Actually, in the region, um, we're falling well behind Multnomah County, Portland, and Washington County. Yeah. Um, and I don't have those numbers with me, but I, I've done those numbers. And our staff ratio is quite low compared to those 
as well. Ms. Lee and then Commissioner Fisher. Yes, my question falls into the same area. I was wondering if the county has kind of an intensive, detailed emergency management plan for an earthquake and if that's available to the citizens online to get prepared or yes, do their ma part. Yes, ma'am. So we actually have a all hazards plan. It's called the Emergency Operations Plan, and it is a public document, mm -hmm. and it is on our website. We also have other plans that relate to that plan that we're required to ha have, which is the Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan, which was just updated. Um, our BCC signed off on it in April of this year. It is also available online. Um, and we have a Wildland Fire Protection Plan that is also available online. Um, the pieces that are around Cascadia, um, we, you see that you, it is in the emergency operations plan, but there's also pieces of it in some other plans, like our debris management plan, which is not completed yet, but will be. Um, you'll see those pieces coming together there. But all of our plans are public, and they are on our website. Thank you. Commissioner Fisher and then Commissioner Schrader. When I... Uh, Began this journey as a commissioner, I joined you and the medical examiner to learn about what the key issues were. And one thing that really sh kind of shocked me was the increase at that time, that was 2017, mm -hmm. was the increase in deaths due to drug overdoses that the medical examiner was dealing with mm -hmm. at that moment in time. And I'm just curious mm -hmm. now, it's, um, well, well, gosh, is it two years later? Mm -hmm. I'm curious how what's changed, if things have changed, if things have settled down, there were new drugs um, filtered throughout in drugs like fentanyl and other things, and I'm just curious right. what our medical examiner's up to. These so days. it's kind of interesting because I just had that conversation with Kathy not too long ago. We actually are seeing a decline in those deaths. Mm -hmm. um, I think part of that is due to Narcan, and that's being more available um, in our communities. Um, and um, maybe some more education. But she also did say that though we may be seeing a decrease, that Multnomah County in particular, she thinks is seeing an increase or at least it's remaining stable. So we don't know, we don't know why. We honestly don't know why, but ours has went down and I, 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 a lot of it I think is due to Narcan. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Schrader. So uh, I wasn't actually gonna, I really appreciate what you do because we have a county that has a volcano. <laughs> we have a lot of things. <laughs> we have a lot of issues. Uh, meandering rivers, yes. all kinds of opportunities, um, you know, beside the Commission Cascadia Schrader, event. Could you be move your microphone bes again? Beside Thank the you. Cascadia event, I mean, yes. we've got right. um, challenging topography. We have, like I said, the volcano. Not active, but landslides, you name it, it's here. And yet we yet flood. Oh, Lord, it's locusts are going to come. And, eat us <laughs> and, <Yeah>. and frogs. <laughs> and, <laughs> and frogs raining from heaven. I know I'm getting biblical here. But um, I guess my real, why are, we uh, why are we falling behind the other two counties? I mean, what's the, what do you think is the driver of I, I that? I do know, I mean, uh, for example, what? last year, and I know that things could change this year. I know that there's a lot of uh, areas that are struggling with, with budget. Um, but for example, last year, Portland got a 25% increase in their general fund. So they've been, so they've been putting money, more money is, into it. Um, in Multnomah County as well. Um, they used to have as many staff as I do, which now they've at least doubled over the past okay. probably four years. So in a follow-up is how much is that due to the notion that climate change is exacerbating uh, extreme weather and things of that sort that, um, and again, here it's probably going to be flooding. And You know, I think what's sort, interesting in Portland, I think no. it's more Cascadia that has driven part of that. Because really? Of, okay. Well, yeah, because of the buildings and stuff. Mm -hmm. For me and for us. Now, we have that same issue, not quite as intensely as they do, but trust me, we have the same issue. But for us and here, we have wildland fire, which is huge. Oh, okay. And it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Mm -hmm. And every year I cross my fingers and toes that, you know, we just don't have it because, um, you know, we have one way in, one way out for many people. So, you know, that's looming for us. 
um, the uh, drought is even looming for us. Every year again, it's like I just, oh, you know, I hope we don't have to go down that drought road because that's a really difficult road to go down because of certain state laws and certain things going on there. Um, we, have, we have a volcano, and it may not be active, but it's also not dormant. It's, 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 it's steaming. Stuff it steams. Up. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. that could happen this afternoon, yeah. right? So we have a lot of, you know, things that, but, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, but it's true. Take care of me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I came here to scare you today. No, that's um, right. You know, but we have, but we also yeah, have more flooding than they do. Um, yeah. We, even when we talked about the CMZ and the Sandy River and the, you know, the, the migrating river, when I talk about that, the RDPO, they're just kind of like, you know, whatever, because they don't have them, right? I mean, so we have some of the things. I do think a lot of what was driving and has been driving the, and maybe even Washington County has been Cascadia. Okay. Um, but our drivers, we have more than just Cascadia. And we also have also some more fault lines that they have to do. Not just Cascadia, but other fault lines that can well, impact us more heavily. We also have 51% of our land in national forest. And I know that there's been uh, movement at the federal level to not keep using forest service money, but to actually use dollars, separate dollars that are disaster dollars specifically for fire uh, issues. Are we, are we in the loop with anything of that sort? Or is um, it just still Congress, well, saying but not doing? I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah, the last, I, I could find that out, but I probably the last thing you heard the news is the last thing I have. And yeah. we haven't had that conversations um, with our U.S. Forest Service recently. But that might be something to consider. There is supposed to be additional dollars for forest fires, and as mm -hmm. you said, yeah. um, we're really the... Yeah, and that's true, um, but I will say, too, and I don't know if we could share those dollars, but all of the evacuation planning, all of, you know, all of that is the county's responsibility. Okay, and who is the one way in, one way out? Because that's scary because it's happening in There's several California. communities on Mount Hood. Really? That have, okay. Yes, we actually did um, some uh, wildland fire uh, sessions recently. We did four of them. We did two on Mount Hood because we had so many people who wanted yeah. to go to it. And there are a lot of people in that room is like, we have one way out, one, one way in, one way out. And what do we do? <laughs> and, you know, that's a hard question because, and basically it's like, if you see smoke, get out. Get out. Don't wait for us to tell you to get out. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I didn't mean to be so gloom and doom. But I, used to, <laughs> I used to do what Jim did. You took over the disaster management, but it was intriguing. Yeah. But that was when we had dollars, too. Yeah. There was dollars. a lot of money flowing in at one time. Yeah. Commissioner Humberston, and then Commissioner Savas. I, I would just uh, point out that it's always difficult to get any organization or even individual people to spend money on what ifs. Mm -hmm. There's so, so many immediate needs more more. That, that come to our attention right now, mm -hmm. and then having to spend a lot of money on a, on a what if it might occur, even though we know it will occur at some point in time. It's, just, it's very difficult to do that. And you, I mean, how many times have you gone out and talked to public groups about, you know, have, have a go bag in your car and all those. And if 10% if of the people actually do that, mm -hmm. I'd be surprised. Right. It's just yeah. very difficult to get people to do that. You know, and it's interesting, though, whenever you look at uh, PGA, whenever they have done the um, surveys, we are at the top. Yeah, you know, we're important to our residents of the county. But at the same time, you ask them that question. And we have a lot of concern, too. I mean, there are people out there who can't put food on the table tonight. How are they going to be prepared for a disaster, and how do we make them yep. more resilient? So that's something we are looking at doing, too, in the near future as well. Commissioner Savas? Well, I just got to say, to Commissioner Humberson's point, um, I'll never forget my first business meeting uh, in January 2011 as a commissioner, and that was declaring an emergency at Lolo Pass when we had a flood. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> and, um, and it blew out that road, road, and on the other end of the road was a stranded community. Yeah. No way in, no mm -hmm. way out. So um, definitely felt the, um, mm -hmm. what, what, what it was like, the urgency yeah. and the emergency and all of that. Yeah. Followed a couple years later with a threatening fire that came over right around in June, I believe, a couple years later, um, that we were concerned about coming dollar. over the whole run mm -hmm. in Clackamas County. When we were there up at the mountain for a C4 retreat, the smoke was yep. intense. It was pretty bad. Yeah. Followed by the fire in Escada. 
Yes. Right? <laughs> uh, which is the big one. And that, I mean, all of those took a lot of staff time, took a lot mm -hmm. of, you know, county commissioner time. We were up there. Yeah. And then um, the small one, I guess call it the small one, was when we uh, lost the abutment at the Gladstone Trolley Bridge when that fell in the river in Clackamas here. Right. A couple of years after that. So it seems like every couple of years there's been a cycle of something. Mm -hmm. I think the bridge falling down was the smallest one, but still yeah. it took a lot of it took yeah. a lot of emergency response and there was a lot of concern mm -hmm. and um, again a lot of staff time and yeah. so it, it's on. very labor intensive. Um, and also, I mean, we're six people in this particular program. And so we can't do it without our stakeholders. So we have to build those relationships with those stakeholders as well. But and um, that is a large part of what we do as well for the county is making sure we have relationships with our cities, our fire defense board, you know, water districts and those types of things. Um, and all of those are heavy lifts. Some of them not as heavy as others, but they're all heavy lifts. Yeah. Seeing no other questions, Nancy, we thank you very much. Hey, and thank, thank you. you, Sarah.